Now with our 2013 commencement address, Gus Fett. Thank you. Hi, everybody. What a great honor it is for me to get this degree and to have this opportunity to be your commencement speaker at this unique and very important university. The administrators and the faculty I know here are truly inspiring. And I hear the students are pretty special, too. Congratulations to you all, and thanks to the parents. I, um, when I was asked to do this, I asked if it, in, in accepting I could become an honorary Bostonian, and I was assured that I could. <laughs> I suspect that uh, many of you have heard Woody Allen's uh, famous uh, commencement quip. Uh, Two paths lie ahead of you, he said to the eager graduates. One leads to utter despair and the other to extinction. <laughs> May you have the choice, the wisdom to choose wisely. When I told my son I'd be here today, I quoted Woody to him, and he said, don't go too negative on them, Dad. And I'm afraid I do have a minor reputation for doing that, but I'm not going there today. Somehow I've become somewhat of an old man, and surely, old man, you've got something useful to impart to the younger generation. In fact, I've thought very hard about what I have learned and what might be truly helpful to you, something positive. So let me stay up front. The most important thing I've learned over the years, what we've got mainly to get us through life with a maximum of happiness and a minimum of suffering is simply each other. In the end, I think it's just that simple. The main thing that gives meaning to our lives and indeed to the world is caring so much for others that we act to create for them as much joy and as little suffering as possible. As the philosopher George Santiago said, there is no cure for birth or death save to enjoy the interval. And that enjoyment of life, above all, requires companionship and affection and support, things we can only receive from each other. I say it's just that simple, but of course, we all too often seek to impart meaning to our lives in other ways. Almost universal is the tendency to try to find meaning at the mall. Here I refer to our consumerism, our affluenza. How wrongheaded to think that we can satisfy our non-material needs with more materialism, uh, more stuff. Advertisers seduce us to try to meet these non-material needs by buying stuff, cars and clothing, jewelry, beer, and so much more. Madison Avenue and its clients love it precisely because it doesn't work. There is no meaning to be found at the mall, but somehow it doesn't stop us. We keep on buying shop till we drop. But at some level, more and more people sense that this consumerism involves a great misdirection of life's energy. We know we're slighting the precious things that no market can provide that make life truly worthwhile. So here's a revolutionary new product that's trying to make it at the mall. Recently, a group of young women set up a stand in a mall in the Midwest to sell nothing. They promised that nothing was guaranteed not to put you in debt, 100% non-toxic, sweatshop free, doesn't contribute to global warming, it's family friendly, it's fun and creative, and when they refused to leave the mall, they were arrested. <laughs> well, good for them, right? So what is it that makes us truly happy? Uh, that's this question addressed by a new field of positive psychology. And when a founder of this new field was asked to identify the roots of human happiness, his answer was quite simple, other people. We flourish in a setting of warm and nurturing and rewarding interpersonal relationships. And within that context, we flourish best 
when we are giving, not getting. So I've spoken mainly so far about caring for each other at the personal level, uh, but caring for others is an opportunity that opens up in many spheres. So let me mention three others. First, care for your place, your community, wherever you live. In America, we've had enough throwaway cities and runaway businesses. So build the future locally. Create intentional communities, transition towns, launch new enterprises that are rooted and sustainable, that have a higher purpose than mere profit. There's no Washington-style gridlock stopping us from acting where we live. Follow the food. Second, care for your country, wherever it is. Listen to this. Here's what Thomas Jefferson wrote at the end of his presidency. The care of human life and happiness is the first and only legitimate object of good government. My goodness. What if the people in Washington actually believe that today? We Americans had another wonderful, caring, President in Franklin Roosevelt. In his last State of the Union address in 1944, he called on America to accept, and I quote, a second Bill of Rights under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. And Roosevelt went on to list these rights, the right to a good job, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and to enjoy good health. The right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age and sickness and accident and unemployment. The right, the right to a good education. Imagine these as rights. And that's in fact what the International Declaration of Human Rights does. Whatever the sad craziness of U.S. politics in the current moment, the proposition that we should have these rights is not radical. They are the rights, not the hopes, not the promises, but the rights sought for all of us by a great American president just yesterday when I was two. <laughs> to secure these rights and others, we all need to escape the clutches of the reigning neoliberal orthodoxy. In America and elsewhere, elsewhere, we need to build an economy and a politics that give priority to people and to place and to planet rather than to profit and product and power. Some have called it the caring economy. Still others have called it the solidarity economy or the sharing economy at the New Economy Coalition based here in Boston. We're just calling it the New Economy. Join with us and help us build it. Rebecca Solnit has written that the grounds for hope are in the people who are inventing the world while no one looks. Join us in this effort. George Bernard Shaw famously remarked that all progress depends on being unreasonable. My friends, it's time for a large amount of civic unreasonableness. It's time for a deeper, it's time for a deeper critique of why our economies aren't working for people and place and planet. Remember, to protest because you care for your country is an act of high patriotism. And remember what Frederick Douglass said in the fight against slavery, power concedes nothing without a demand. And lastly, my friends, care for our planet and care for the children and grandchildren and all future generations who will inhabit it. 
The young poet Drew Dellinger said it well about future generations when he wrote, it's 3.23 in the morning and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren asked me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? And today we know that caring for our endangered planet requires much deeper change than we imagined just a few decades ago in 1970, say, when I was on the mall in Washington for the first Earth Day. Today's environmentalism, I'm afraid, is not going to save the environment. Environmental action has got to dig deeper and challenge the root causes of our problems, our consumerism and misguided values, the ascendancy of money power over people power, the worship of GDP as if it would actually deliver, the neglect of social justice and much more. We've got to see these as part of the environmental agenda or we'll never accomplish what we need to accomplish. And when we think, <laughs> when we think about caring for the earth, let's always remember that that caring must extend to all the life that evolved here with us. It doesn't matter, for example, whether we don't like a particular species or think it's unimportant. We didn't create it. And we do not own it. It has intrinsic value. Nature has rights. The cultural historian and visionary Thomas Berry observed that humans created the concept of rights and then gave them all to themselves. Aldo Leopold saw plainly and wrote beautifully that the ethics by which we live must extend to caring for the land and all of the life on it. As my friend and author Terry Tempest Williams has noted, we can no longer say, let nature take care of itself. As you leave here and go forward, will your caring succeed? Well, I believe that your generation can and will succeed in many many ways, and hopefully much better than mine did. Remember that there's tremendous power, as has been previously said here, in having a dream. So dream of a new place where the pursuit of happiness is sought not in more getting and spending, but in the growth of human solidarity and real democracy and devotion to the public good, where the average person, the average person is empowered to achieve his or her human potential where the benefits of economic activity are widely and equitably shared, where the environment is sustained for current and future generations, and where the virtues of simple living and community self-reliance and good fellowship and respect for nature are the predominant ones. We can build this future if we join together and fight for it. Of course, of course there are bound to be setbacks, personally, nationally, otherwise, uh, there'll be times when our efforts at caring don't seem to be working. But you know, as well as I, that giving up is never an option. For example, consider the principal thing that I've done in the public arena, and that is to work in every way over 35 years to hold back the onslaught of climate change. Well, I hadn't succeeded very well, have I? But I have at least succeeded at trying. And if that's not enough, it's still a lot. Moreover, this fight to save our planet from that climate tsunami that's right offshore is not over. And with your help, we're going to win it. We simply must. Bill McKibben and 350.org are surely correct that they are real villains in the climate story. The fossil fuel executives who are determined to maximize profit, to defeat regulation, most of them knowing full well that they are ruining the planet but not caring. And that's why it's vital, I think, for all colleges and universities to divest out of fossil fuels. Not, not because we think it's going to bring big oil and big coal to their knees, but because it's the right thing to do. 
This climate struggle over those 35 years has been like rolling a rock to the top of a hill only to see it roll back down to the bottom again. So let me close with the remarkable interpretation of Sisyphus and his rock given to us by Albert Camus in his The Myth of Sisyphus. Camus says that Sisyphus was condemned by the gods to the dreadful punishment of futile and hopeless labor, forever rolling his rock to the top of the mountain only to have it fall back again of its own weight. Camus says that Sisyphus' crime was his hatred of death, his passion for life. But Camus, in the end, finds Sisyphus superior to his fate, stronger than his rock. I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain, Camus writes, but the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a person's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. The struggle itself, Camus concludes, is full of meaning. So here is my advice to you. Find your rock. Find your rock. You never know. It might just stay up there one day. Good luck to you. Take care of each other. Take care of your community. Take care of your country. Take care of the planet. Thank you.